In the previous part of this tutorial, we created our first program and called one of the existing functions in Twinkiet called ADS Logstream, in where we could print a hello world message to the Visual Studio error list. In that function, we use the string hello world as input to the function. In this part, we will dive deeper into the various data types that are available in the IAC 611.31-3 standard that Twinkiet implements. We'll also look at pointers and references and why we would want to use them. Then we will end this part by a quick look at how to declare and use arrays. Generally talking about data types isn't too exciting, it's just one of those things you have to learn. I'll try to make this topic at least a little bit fun. <laughs> Let's start with asking what a variable is. Variables are used to store information to be referenced and manipulated in a computer program. They provide a way of labeling data with a descriptive name so our programs can be understood more clearly by the developer. Think of variables as containers that hold information. Their sole purpose is to label and store data in memory. This data can then be used throughout your program. When creating a variable, you need to define what data type it should have. Twinkia 3 follows the standard of IAC 611.31-3, of which data types are available. In Twinkia 3, all variables are declared between the keywords var and end var. In this example, we only have one variable declared, and the name of the variable is f cabinet temperature, and it's of type real, which is a floating point value. Giving good names to variables is a task that should not be underestimated. I've been writing software for many years, and I still think that giving variables a good name is hard. Once in a while, discussions pop up on programming forums regarding name conventions of variables, and this usually get people very involved. For Twinka 3 software, there are some naming conventions available. I've written a little about this on my Twinkat blog. Down in the description below, you'll find a link to that post if you want to read more about this. If you've done any programming in languages such as JavaScript or Python, you've been using a language that is dynamically typed. Structured text and IEC 611.31-3 is statically typed. The difference is that first, dynamically typed languages perform type checking at runtime while statically typed languages perform type checking at compile time. Secondly, statically typed languages require you to declare the data types of your variables before you use them, while dynamically typed languages do not. So, which data types do we have in the PLC world? I'll show you the most common types in the IAC standard. For every type I will present the value range, that is, which values that type can have, the total memory consumption for one instance of the variable, and just a simple example. We will start with booleans. A bool can only hold the value false or true and uses one byte of memory in the PLC. You declare a variable by giving it a name, followed by a colon and a data type. In the declaration, the variable can optionally be assigned a value. If a value is not assigned in the declaration, the variable will get a default value, which for booleans is the value false. In Twinka 3 we have a wide range of integral data types. The most basic one is int, which is signed and thus is capable of representing both positive and negative integers. It requires two bytes in the PLC. Next we have uint, which occupies the same amount of memory as the signed int but because it is unsigned, you can have twice as many positive integers. Next we have the short signed integer, which only occupies one byte compared to the signed integer. Then we have the unsigned version, that is the unsigned short integer, occupying the same amount of memory but only allowing positive integers. Now we're going to start to look into types that use a little more memory. Next we have the signed double int, which use double the amount of memory compared to the standard signed integer, that is 4 bytes. The dint also has an unsigned version, in other words, an unsigned double integer. But we're not quite at the end yet. There is also a 64 bit that is an 8 bytes version called signed long integer. This occupies double the amount of memory as a signed double integer. And just as with the other integer types, there is an unsigned version of this as well. 
As you can see, the upper bound number is really, really big. The unsigned long integer would probably be hard to say in words. And just looking at it now, I realize that's an insane big number. I wonder how many stars there are in the universe and how that compares to this number. Okay, let's actually compare this to the amount of stars in the universe. So, how many star? How many stars in the entire universe? Yes. Okay, that's a very very big number. Let's check. Let's remove the commas. Yeah, that's a lot of zeros, but the universe is a big place after all. Let's copy this number. Yeah. Okay. So the universe has more. The universe has more stars than an unsigned long integer in Twinket can take, but this is still a very big number. Okay, now we know. Okay, sorry for that sidetrack. Next we have some more integer type data types. Byte can store the values between 0 and 255, and just as a short integer only consumes one byte of the memory. I want to point out a neat feature with PLC programming here, and that is that it's possible to define the base of the integer by writing the base number, a hashtag, and then the value in that base format. So for example, if we enter a base of 2, which is binary, and then write a value of 10110011, this means it is a value of 179 in base 10. If we don't explicitly declare the base, it will implicitly be declared with base 10. Now that I have worked with PLCs for a while, I've started to take this neat feature for granted. But it's just such a good feature, especially when you integrate your system with other systems and you need to exchange data and you have some documentation for that subsystem in where they are documenting everything in hexadecimal, for example. Next we have the word data type, which is twice as big as a byte. In here, as an example, I have defined and declared a variable in hexadecimal format, that is with base 16. Next we have a double word, which not very surprisingly is twice as big as a word. Here, again, I've used base 16 for the value. Finally we have the huge 8 bytes L word. In here I have assigned the value with explicitly the base 10. This is not necessary, as it will implicitly be base 10. One really useful feature of structured text is that I can do bit accessing on variables. That is, I can access individual bits of a variable. This is achieved by writing the variable name, a dot, and which bit I want to access. The bit addressing start, starts with 0, and in the example of the byte, which is 8 bits big, it goes from 0 to 7. If I write the variable name, in this case n some variable, and then dot 3, I'm accessing the fourth bit from the right. I can store the value of the bit access in a separate variable of either type bit or bool. The floating point data types are used to, well, represent floating values. There are only two variants, real and long real. Real occupies 4 bytes and long real occupies 8 bytes. The equivalent to real and long real in the C world are the float and double data types, respectively. With strings, you can store textual data. If you declare a variable with the type string, it will occupy 80 bytes of data, one byte for each character plus one byte for null terminating the string. This means you can store up to 80 characters in the string. Even though we can declare strings basically as big as we want, most built-in functions of Twinka3 to process strings have a limit of 255 characters. We will get back to this limit of 255 characters in a future episode of this tutorial. In here I just demonstrate how to declare a string with another size than 80, in this case a string that can have 300 characters. Strings are ASCII coded, so each byte in a string is according to the ASCII character table. The ASCII coding is this table that I hope each and one of you have in your back pocket at all times. Next we have W string, short for white string. The white string is using the Unicode character set and UTF-16 encoding. 
The difference between ASCII and Unicode is basically that Unicode has a much wider selection of characters to represent. So for example, here in Sweden, we have the characters O, Ä, and Ö, which are not available in the ASCII table, but they are available in the Unicode character set. In Unicode, depending on which character we want to encode, the memory consumption for every character can vary. Every character can be either one or two words, that is, two or four bytes. This means that the amount of characters we can store in a W string is dependent on which characters we store in it. If you just declare a variable as a V string, its size is set to 80 plus 1 words. In other words, 160 plus 2 bytes. Note that the quotation marks for assigning the variable a value differ between string and W string. Just as with strings, you can define the size of the variable yourself. In this case, we have declared a W string with the size of 300 plus 1 word, that is 600 plus 2 bytes. This means that we can store up to 300 characters in this W string. I have to be honest and say that I've yet to this day never used W strings in any of the projects I've been working with. I guess the use cases for when you really need something like W strings is usually at the front end, in other words, an HMI, and not in the PLC business logic code, but I'm sure there are use cases for when you need a W string in the PLC code. Next we have data types available for declaring dates and times. These are very useful and quite easy to use. First we have time, where you can specify a time. It's a 4 byte data value and the resolution of the time is 1 millisecond. When setting a value to a time variable you can specify the time using days, hours, minutes, seconds, and milliseconds. Note that you have to use the characters t hash when assigning a time value. You will use the time data type a lot in your PLC software development career. Personally, this is the data type I've been using the most of all the time and date data types, for the simple reason that there are so many functions that depend on it. Next we have the time of day data type, which uses 4 bytes of memory and has 1 millisecond resolution. As the name implies, it's used when you need to define the time of day for something. It's defined using hours, minutes, seconds and milliseconds. Note that you have to write a TOD hash short for time of day before the actual value. Next we have the date data type, which occupies 4 bytes of memory and has a resolution of 1 second, although only the day is presented. Note that you have to write a D hash short for date before the actual value. Next we have the date and time data type, which is a combination of the time data type and the date data type, so you can present both date and time. It still only occupies 4 bytes of memory with 1 second resolution. You have to write a dt hash short for date and time before the actual value. Finally we have our first 8 byte data type, the L time, which is short for long time. It's a higher resolution version of time, where it's not only possible to specify days, hours, minutes and milliseconds as in time, but also microseconds and nanoseconds. The resolution of the data type is 1 nanosecond. In very high speed tasks, that is sub millisecond tasks, which are easily achievable with Bekoff PLCs and Twinka 3, this data type comes in handy. You have to write L time hash before the value. I find this time and date data types that are available in the ISC standard very convenient, and just the fact that they are available in the standard tells us a lot about how important it is with time in PLCs. The fact that the times are in a human-readable format makes it much easier to handle both from the software developer perspective, but also from a user perspective. When you are going to do uh, PLC software debugging, it's extremely convenient to be able to log into the PLC and watch the variables live values in a human-readable format. There are several functions and function blocks that are using time as either input or output which we will get back to in a coming episode of this tutorial. You don't need to learn any of these time and date data types by heart. 
I think the only one I've learned by heart over the years is time. And that's for the simple reason that I've, it's used a lot. For the others, I always refer to the documentation. You just need to be aware of the fact that there are data types in the IEC standards specifically to handle date and time. An enumeration is a user-defined type that consists of a set of named integral constants that are known as enumerators. With enumerations, it's possible to basically put some description to the data without having to put comments in the code. An enumeration consists of an identifier, which you use when you instantiate the enumeration. Next, we have an enumeration list in where you define the different values that the enumeration can have. An enumeration has by default a base type of int, that is the 2-byte integer. By default and implicitly, the first value is assigned the integer value of 0, and the next one is 1, etc. You can assist other values explicitly. Next we have the optional type. If this is not provided, the enumeration will implicitly have a base type of integer. You declare an enumeration variable by defining a name for it, just as with any other variable, colon, and then the enumeration identifier. Then you can assign any of the enumeration values to the variable by using the enumeration identifier dot and the enumeration value. Thanks to IntelliSense in Visual Studio, if you enter the identifier, you get all the different enumeration options visible. All enumeration types are globally accessible, which is in contrast to for example C++ where you can define an enumeration to be only accessible in the scope already it was declared. So once you create an enumeration, the enumeration type is accessible from everywhere in your program. Although this has its advantages, it can also be disadvantages especially when you start to work with libraries, which we will talk about in a coming part of this tutorial. When you have lots of enumerations available, you can get something called namespace pollution, in where two enumerations in two separate libraries, but with the same name, are used in a project. I would love to see a possibility to be able to define enumerations with a more local scope in a future version of the IAC standard. I hear many of you ask the question, but why not use comments next to the integer whatever data type I'm using instead? Code should be self-explanatory. With comments you just add something else that needs to be maintained and that most likely will be wrong after the code has been changed. To create an enumeration, right-click on DUTs. Select Add, then click on DUT. This will bring up a new window in where you can define new DUTs, that is, data unit types. Write the name that is the identifier in the name text box. Make sure enumeration ready box is selected. Click open. Your enumeration is created. Now you can fill in the enumeration list. There are a few other data types available in the ISC standard and Twinka 3, but these are the most common ones. I'll leave a link in the description below to the Beckhoff's documentation for all data types if you want to read more. In Twinka 3, and in PLCs in general, all type declaration is done at compile time. You have to declare the data types of your variables before you use them, and the type cannot be changed during the execution of the program. Implicitly trying to convert from one type to another will generally result in a compiler warning or error, which I'll talk more about soon. In PLCs, you generally allocate memory up front. Dynamic memory allocation, the way it can be done in, for example, C++, can be done in Twinkat, although it is generally shunned upon. Okay, what I'm going to show you now is the operator size of, and what this operator is used for is to determine the required size in bytes uh, for a specific variable. So if we create a variable here, let's, for example, just create a, uh, one float. Uh, and another one, this is a string, and maybe an integer, an integer. Then we can use the operator size of, that gives us the size in bytes for a specific variable. So let's start with the float. And what this returns is, as I said, the number of bytes uh, of this that this real value is taking. Uh, but the data type, that's dependent on how many bytes that are actually returned. 
but now we can just create a return value for this and a return variable that we called uh, return number of bytes and we'll just declare it as an unsigned double integer which is quite big so this size of will always return an unsigned value okay so that's what we're gonna get here and we can do the same for for the others so the same for the string so n uh, let's call this one actually return num number of bytes for float okay so and return number of bytes for string and return number of bytes for integer then we do like this uh, we do this string and we do the size of for the string and then we do the same thing for the return number of bytes for integer and we do this for the integer so this is what we're gonna get the number of bytes for each of these three data types these instances of the data types so let's run this So this is quite a this is quite a neat feature, uh, and it's you're definitely gonna use it at some point or another. For example, when you use some external libraries, uh, let me think of something. Okay, so we, for example, if you're gonna use TCP/IP communication, you're gonna send some data over a socket. Uh, a socket is used uh, over the web, so over TCP/IP communication, when you wanna send some data uh, to another computer, uh, then. Um, you, you're gonna need to use a library for this. You're gonna create a socket and you're gonna send data through this socket. And when you when you call the method to, to send the data, you need to supply which data should be sent. Uh, so you need to prepare some form of buffer, uh, either like this, a string, uh, maybe it's just a string buffer or, or more normally you have some sort of byte buffer that you wanna send. And, and this has a defined size and you wanna send a defined amount of bytes. Uh, so then you usually call this function and, and you supply it with the size of the data that you want to send. Okay, so we do this, log in. Yes. And we run it. Yeah, and as you see, the float is four bytes, just as we have learned, or the, the real actually, that's what it's called in the IAC standard. The string is 81 bytes, so again, a string, uh, if you don't write the size, it's implicitly 80 bytes plus one byte, so 80 bytes for your characters plus one byte for the null terminating character. And the integer, just the default integer, is, uh, is two bytes big. Our next subject is pointers. Pointers are symbolic representation of addresses. They are a symbolic representation for an address in the memory of the PLC, so that you can access a location of the computer's memory by a name. They are declared in this way. The pointer is a variable in itself. It holds the address of the memory location of the variable it is pointing to. Thus, in a 64-bit system, a pointer uses 64 bits of memory, in other words, 8 bytes. What we have in this example is a pointer to an integer. If you write it like this, this pointer doesn't point to anything. If we would look at the value of the pointer now, it would just be the address 0. I'm clarifying, the pointer doesn't hold an integer, but an address to a memory location, which hopefully will be an integer. I'm saying hopefully now, I will soon explain why I say hopefully. To assign an address to the pointer so that it's pointing to a variable, use the address operator. If you want to change the value of the variable that the pointer is pointing to, you might think that the obvious way to do it is this way. Simply assign a new integer value to the pointer. But what you are doing if you are doing this is that you are changing the address of the pointer so that it's pointing to some other memory location in the computer. In this case, if we changed p pointer to 30, we would change the address from this address to this. It would just point to some weird place in the computer's memory. This is not what we want to do. To get access to the actual content of what the pointer is pointing to, you have to dereference it by applying the content operator to the pointer identifier. 
Now we have updated the actual value of the memory location from the initial 20 to 30. In this example, we have a date and time variable and a pointer to a string. Then we assign the address of the date and time variable to the string pointer. Notice that the compiler doesn't complain when we assign the address of a date and time variable to a pointer that is supposed to point to a string. That is one of the problems with pointers. A pointer is just an address to a memory location in the PLC. Pointers can become quite dangerous. In this trivial example, we are intentionally pointing to another data type than expected. But when you are in the domain of using pointers, this is exactly what happens unintentionally. Because the string pointer is pointing to a date and time variable, although it's expecting a string, if we dereference the string pointer, we will just get these garbage characters instead. Although pointers can be very powerful, there are other more safe ways to reference data that I'd recommend using instead, and that's what we're going to look at now. Let's now look at references. While a pointer is just a variable with an address, a reference is the object, just with another name, so see it as an alias. You declare a reference pretty much in the same way as a pointer, but you use the keywords reference to instead. When assigning a value to a reference, you use the operator ref equals. In this example, we have a reference to an integer and it's assigned the value n variable integer. When assigning a new value to the reference, you don't need to use any dereferencing like with pointers. You just use the variable just like if you would use the normal variable. So again, just see it as an alias for the variable it is reference for. When declaring a reference, you can't assign a reference of a type to a variable of another type. In this example, we have a date and time variable and an integer variable. If I declare a reference to an integer and try to assign, assign this reference a variable with a type of date and time, the compiler complains and we won't be able to compile our software. So these are the main advantages of using a reference compared to a pointer. First, they are easier to use. You don't need to assign an address of a variable, but you assign the reference directly to the variable you are referencing. When using the reference, you don't need to do any weird dereferencing, but can use the reference directly just as if it was the variable. Secondly, it's more type safe. A reference of one type can't be a reference to a variable of another type as we just saw. We get this check directly at compile time. Though I'm mostly using references whenever I can, I have noticed differences compared to C++ for example. If we look at the C++ standard, it's very specific and says that a reference shall be initialized to refer to a valid object or function. With this simple code example, I've tried to create a reference to an int that doesn't reference anything. In this case, the C++ compiler will complain and say references must be initialized. It won't compile. In IEC 611.31-3, it seems much more relaxed, as it's entirely possible to create a reference that doesn't reference anything. There is an operator available called isValidRef, in where it's possible to check whether the reference is valid, that is, if it's other than zero. But this is executed during runtime, so it defeats parts of the purpose of references. If you would run this code, you would get an exception and the PLC would crash. The sad smiley is, by the way, how I look like every time I get an exception. The reference still has the mentioned advantages over pointers and should be preferred. You can do a size off on the reference and get the size of the referenced object. So here we have an integer that is 2 bytes and the size off on, of the reference is 2. If you would do a size off on a pointer, you would get the size of the pointer, not the size of the object that the pointer is pointing to. So in this example, we have an integer and a pointer to an integer, and the size isn't the size of the integer, but the size of the pointer. So again, if we have a 64-bit system, then the size of the pointer is 8 bytes. 
Just as in modern C++, you should try to avoid pointers. For instance, in C++, I could find myself avoiding usage of pointers in some occasions by using method overloads, if I needed to perform some data manipulation on different types of data. In the IC standard for PLCs, we don't have method overloads. You can't create a function or method that has the same name but different input parameters. Also, in Twinkat, we don't have anything equivalent to the C++ standard library's smart pointers like shared or unique pointer, so you really need to be careful when using pointers. For all you new PLC or non-C++ developers, we're going to get back to functions in the next part of this tutorial, so don't worry, we will get back to this topic soon again. Just showing you pointers and references like this doesn't really clearly show why you would want to use them. But this will be more obvious once we start to shuffle larger amounts of data between the different code functions that we're going to develop. Which leads us to the question, when do I use pointers or references? We're going to get to this topic when we start to look at functions and methods. For now, you only need to know that it's, for example, done when you create a function or method and you want to use some data in that function that comes from the outside of that function and the data is big. So not just a single integer or real. But when we have, for example, larger arrays and we want to avoid data copying from the outside of the function to the inside. That is, we want to pass data, uh, data by reference and not by value. We'll get back to the concept of passing by value and passing by reference in our future parts of this tutorial. In these simple examples, when we are just using a pointer or reference to an integer, it of course doesn't make much sense. It makes more sense when the data we are referencing and we want to avoid data copying. So if I'm going to use pointers or references, when should I use pointers and when should I use references? I don't like to give general advice as there are always the exceptions to the rules and people are always going to mention the exceptions. And I can already see the comments below being filled with people mentioning, mentioning those. But everyone, including myself, love general rules, so I will give you one. The general rule is use references when you can and pointers when you have to. Now we'll briefly touch on the topic of arrays. An array is a series of elements of the same type placed in contiguous memory locations that can be individually referenced by adding an index to a unique identifier. You declare an ar array in this way. In here we have created an array that stores five integers in this example, we can see that all values in the array are initialized with zero, just as any other integer if we haven't assigned a value to it. We can initialize the array with other values in the declaration. You can assign a new value to any element in the array by simply writing the name of the array, brackets, the position of the element in the array, and then the value it should have instead. So here we have replaced the value 20 in the position 2 in the array to the value 133. Compared to most other programming languages, an array in IEC 611.31-3 can be declared to start and end at basically any position. In the first example we had an array starting at position 1 and ending at position 5. We can start at position 0 as well, which is more traditional. We might also start at minus 1 and end at 1, so this array has 3 values. Arrays don't have to be one-dimensional. You can create multidimensional arrays. In this example we have a two-dimensional array and declared in two different ways. In alternative 1 we declare a two-dimensional array with two rows and three columns. In alternative 2, we also declare a two-dimensional array with two rows and three columns. Accessing the arrays is done slightly different depending on how you declare them. For example, look how we access the value in the first row and the first column using alternative 1. Compared to alternative 2. Compared to, for example, C++, the declaration for two-dimensional arrays doesn't look the same for neither of these two alternatives, but accessing the array is similar in alternative 2 to C++. 
also note that the online view with the Twinket IDE looks slightly different depending on how you have declared your two-dimensional array. In this example we have declared an array with five elements and in the declaration set five values. We have also declared an integer with this name n1int. We will just do some simple calculations on the array and store the result in the integer. First we change the value of the first element, so the value 10 is changed to 42. Next we assign the variable n1int the values of the first position in the array, plus the value of the fourth position in the array. This will add the values of the two positions in the array and store it in the integer n1int. The final topic for this part of the tutorial is type conversion. There are type conversions from basically every primitive type in Twinket. Every data type has type conversion operators, and they behave slightly different depending on from which and to which data type you want to convert. The behavior is obviously different if you want to convert from one type of integer to another type of integer, compared to converting from an integer to a string, for example. I will demonstrate one example. Let's assume we have declared two integers, one unsigned short integer and one unsigned integer. The use int is one byte with an upper bound of 255, and the u int is two bytes with an upper bound of 65,535. Let's now assume we assigned the u int, that is the two bytes integer, the value of the use int that is the one byte integer, plus five. The compiler would have no problem with this simply because the uint is bigger than the usint and can easily fit the value of usint plus five. If we would do it the other way around, we would get a compile error stating that we cannot convert the type uint to the type usint, simply because the uint is bigger than the usint and we can't fit the data in the uint inside the usint. What we need to do is to do a type conversion from uint to usint of the uint. That is, we need to convert the value of the bigger data type to a value that can fit inside the smaller data type. But how does that this work? Let's further assume the uint has a value of 259 which is bigger than what we can fit inside the usint, which has the maximum value of 255. If we represent the decimal value of 259 as a binary, this is what we will get. Two bytes, each carrying 8 bits. What the type conversion will do is simply remove the left byte and leave only the right byte. Because one byte is removed in the conversion, we are left with one byte which can fit inside an usint. The right byte's value is 3 in base 10, and we take that plus the 5 from before, which will give us the result 8. A value of 8 can be stored in an usint. Alright, that's about how interesting I could present data types, pointers, references and arrays. Now we have learned how to allocate memory in our PLC, and in the next part, we will look into how we can organize data into structures and actually make something useful with that data using functions. I'll see you in the next part.